You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Why should I listen to the Nerd List Podcast? Because we go there. Where? Everywhere. Human sexuality. They don't care what's in your pants, they love you anyway. Time travelers. The problem is time will f*** back with you. Politics and fandom. What Star Wars has been prior to Disney. It is a white male driven universe. Find us at nerdlistpodcast.com. And on social media at nerdlistpod. Part of this complete breakfast and the ESO Network. The, the Nerd List, List Podcast. Podcast. Listen! Hello and welcome again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast. I am your host, The Monster, back to give you another week of sci-fi news for this week. So, if you hear the wind chimes and the wind a-rustling, I'm in my backyard once more. So, sorry if it bugs you, but I will try to decrease the noise as I go through my editing process. The big three topics I will be talking about for this week is the new Joker trailer in which Joaquin Phoenix is going to be playing the title character, the Clown Prince of Crime, or at least the origin of how he became the Joker. So I'm very interested to have that kind of uh, review for you because I think it's fantastic. So other bit of news I will talk about. It's going to be about the Twilight Zone reboot, so to speak, by Jordan Peele. And they released two episodes, The Comedian and Nightmare on 30,000 Feet, in which it's uh, basically a retelling of the nightmare at 20,000 feet that originally starred our one William Shatner as well as as, um, John Lithgow in the TV, and not TV, but the The movie, based on the TV show, which I'll talk about that as well. And lastly, I will be talking about Ultraman that just was released on Netflix. It's a new anime series. So I've seen about the first five, maybe four and a half episodes of that. So I'll talk about that as well. Friday being April 5th. Hopefully you guys know what April 5th means to... You guys and gals who are all about nerdy dates. So, if you don't know, April 5th, 2063. So, we got some time until that happens. But that's First Contact Day. So, if you are a fan of Star Trek from Star Trek uh, First Contact, duh. (laughs) Or, more appropriate, if you watch Star Trek Enterprise in which they did a dark version of First Contact Day. Uh, That's the day that we're supposed to have First Contact with Vulcans. So if you have not seen that movie, I highly recommend it to you. So what I did for that special day, I ate pancakes. (laughs) Why? Because I wanted to have pancakes. I've been on Atkins for a while And now that for the past week I've been running, I've been wanting to have regular food. Not that I have not been complaining about all the damn bacon and sausage and all that protein stuff, but I wanted to have real food. So, aside from that. All right, so a couple of quick tidbits that I want to pass along. Some really sad news. I'm really pissed off that Netflix is doing this, but... If you have not seen The Curious Creation of Christine McConnell, that's why we're not getting a season two, you bastards. I love this show so much. It is so much fun. It is so quirky and very nerdy that I just really wish that it would continue. 
in this day and age, I want to say that this is not the only venue or avenue for a show like this to exist. Maybe Hulu will pick it up. Maybe Amazon Prime. Who knows? But I think the show of this caliber really deserve to have its second season. So I'm just saying it deserves to be watched. I will be talking about this in a couple of days, but Akira is finally looking to be an actual live action movie. Now, when you say, well, Leonardo, <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio is attached to me, you're like, wait, what? Hold your horses. He, he looks to be at least producing this, right? So we're kind of cool with that. But it's being shot in California. And you go say, wait a minute. And I say, hold your horses. I know it's supposed to take place in Neo Tokyo. And I'm sure they will recreate that in some fashion, even though it's in California. That's the movie magic capital of the world, so to speak. And we have Taka Watiti, who uh, is also attached, supposedly. I, mean, I don't know that 100% because I've been looking on IMDb. It hasn't been there, but production notes or things of that nature has his name attached to that. But since I've talked about uh, Akira before, this is way back, almost a year ago, on actually April 7th of 2017, so two years ago that I talked about this. This is when Jordan Peele had just released his Get Out movie. And because it was a huge success, it was talked about possibly having him direct this new movie. Since that didn't happen, we're in this new phase. And so we'll see what happens with that. But check out my April 7th, 2017 podcast about which I talk about this. And the problems that I think they will have to overcome and address. Plus the back history. All that fun stuff. Also, there is new talk about a Hawkman movie. Since Shazam has come out over the weekend. And it's got really good buzz. And I'm hoping that it'll really do well before Avengers Endgame. Because it really needs to have the money. But because it's at $100 million and not the higher end of a production... It should be okay then to go ahead and start a second movie only because, as I've been reading, and it makes sense, that since the kids are at a certain age, you really can't wait to do this later on. Unless you're going to de-age them and remove their height. You don't want to have to recast them just because they just age out of that role. You really don't, so... I enjoyed that movie, and hopefully Mr. Gene and I will get to that movie review real soon. But again, wow. Good on you. DC, finally. All right, what else? We also have a new Joker, or first-time Joker on Gotham, so to speak. If I remember correctly, Jerome was kind of like the predecessor, kind of building towards that. I have not seen season four, but I've seen the pictures for season five, in which... It looks kind of like a weird-looking version of the Joker, but it's very Joker-ish. But it's a much different Joker than we will be getting about with Joaquin Phoenix, and I'll talk about that soon. Avengers Endgame has gone on sale. And why, for the love of God, would you buy your tickets from eBay? Several hundred dollars more, if not thousands more, for the opening night. I get it. I get the, the demand and the intensity for this movie. I really do. But, dude, you can afford to wait a week. It will be still the exact movie. It's not going away anytime soon. I am not paying a thousand times more than the actual ticket. That makes no sense. Unless that ticket is autographed by the entire cast. Then, yeah, I will consider that. But, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? Urgh. <laughs> All right. Um, since Disney has taken over with Fox, 
The latest news is that it looks like they're going to continue with more aliens and possibly Planet of the Apes storylines, however way they, that approaches for them. We'll see. Also, Idris Elba is not going to be playing Deadshot in Suicide Squad 2. He is still going to be in the movie, but as a different character. So that's still kind of cool, and I'm cool with that. And what else? That's about it. Oh, now speaking about Will Smith, uh, because he had done uh, Deadshot, maybe that could be a thing in the future in which he comes back for number three. But in the meantime, he has, uh, I think, in the works with Ang Lee, a movie called Gemini Man. But from what I've read, it kind of sounds kind of like Looper, which is the Ryan Johnson movie, which is um, Bruce Willis meeting a younger version of himself. And I forgot the actor's name from Third Rock of the Sun, Inception. Oh, my God, it's killing me. Well, that guy <laughs> is going to be kind of like playing against him. So it's Will Smith against a younger Will Smith. So with the de-aging, we'll see. But, you know, Will's up there. He's my age. All right, so I'm going to take a quick break and come back and talk about the Joker. You ever been curious about the real or fictional worlds? In the beginning, there were laser kings <laughs> and giant robots. Those who created... I'm going to feed you to this tentacle monster <laughs> now. <laughs> no. Or what inspires? And uh, I remember being in my room with my brother, and we immediately, like within five seconds, he decided he was a DC fan, and I decided I was a Marvel fan. And we were <laughs> going through and sorting out all of the comics. And you might enjoy Hubie Tigers, the only podcast show where we take life by the tail. Now available on Google Play, Stitcher, and iTunes, and of course, your favorite podcasting network. This is Hear Me Tigers. All right, so now we are going to be talking about the new trailer for the Joker movie. Now, much in a way of past Jokers. You can go back to Cesar Romero with Adam West playing Batman. You can go to Jack Nicholson playing against Michael Keaton. You have Heath Ledger playing against Christian Bale. Then you have Jared Leto playing against the Nat Flag. I guess, in a couple of scenes. But Joaquin Phoenix, um, in this version of the Joker, is pretty much Batman-less, which I'm okay with. Gotham has proved you can do stories without Batman being present, but still focus on that setting, that world. So, it's interesting um, I forgot where did I see this. It might have been a Facebook page or a Twitter feed um, about 1989, which I think the first one came out, and how the Joker was, like in most origins of the comics, uh, turned into the Joker by falling into a vat. Moved to today, the Joker was turned into that character by society. And watching that trailer, it is on a level of someone being turned that has a very negative experience about life, um, tragic at some points. So, like, for example, there is a moment in which he is fully dressed as a clown and he's doing one of those signs to say that the store was closing and... and and some bunch of little punks came along who stole his sign. And he gave chase, and just when he thought he was about to get them, they smashed the sign against his face and, of course, breaking the sign, and then, of course, they run off. So it's a series of events that start this progression 
for Arthur, who was going to be the Joker down the road. And there are certain shots that I'm like, oh my God, Joaquin Phoenix has really pushed himself to like, the level like Christian Bale would do and lose or gain weight for certain roles. So there was this one shot of his back where he's kind of hunched over and he's, you can almost look and see the ribs practically, you know, kind of sticking out. And he was doing some kind of weird contortion thing with his body. I just felt it was kind of uncomfortable. But he's giving this narration and you could see you know, the, the images of him forcing himself to smile, you know, like grabbing his, like pulling his inner mouth out apart to, to force that smile. And you can see how it's not coming. And even though there are moments in which he has, I guess, uh, Zazie B, I'm prim, prim, uh, forgetting her last name, uh, that was Domino in uh, Deadpool is going to be in this movie might be his love interest so but just seeing the way the city is portrayed and how the city can really kind of beat you down I get that I really do get that that's one of the reasons why I left New York um, growing up I can see a life in which if I had stayed, I would have been broken. And you can easily spiral out of control and take the wrong path to just get your piece of the pie. And I'm not going to do the Jefferson song because <laughs> you're not moving on up to the east side. But it is very creepy. It's very intense watching that trailer of his performance. And then along the way, I'm like, there's one scene that he is walking up a flight of stairs with buildings on the side of it. I'm like, I kind of know that building, or at least I know that location, because it reminds me of someplace in the Bronx, but I could be completely wrong, but I know areas of New York that are like that, that kind of concrete jungle. But I, as I was doing some research, it's like it did uh, shooting in Brooklyn and in Queens, and then it moved its production to New Jersey and then back to New York again. But what was interesting also reading is that because Joaquin had lost so much weight, if they were going to do any reshoots, it was going to be at that time. So they were kind of rewriting certain things to be done there because there was no way he could continue physically the way he was. And I'm just kind of blown away by that kind of stamina that you're willing to put yourself in a state of being physically, aside emotionally, I know he's more than capable, but put yourself physically into that new restraint. I can only imagine how it does damage. Now, Heath Ledger had problems uh, in which the Joker kind of, after a while, started to seep into him. And he had to, to I believe, take some kind of narcotics to kind of help him sleep and deal with things and unfortunately it just went too far and he just never regained consciousness shortly after the the making of that movie and hopefully this is not going to happen to joaquin i mean jack nicholson is you know jack nicholson so that's not much of a stretch there but it's just fascinating just the the build-up right now after just watching this one trailer and how this joker can be maybe the best Joker of all, maybe an Oscar-worthy Joker like Heath Ledger. I mean, it's... I'm really looking forward to this. Now, like with any tragedy, right, is that you have the hero of the story suffers great loss. And that loss, you can see, like, you know, he's taking care of his mother, which I'm assuming that's his mother, 
um, his love interest, and I'm sure things of that nature is what's going to put him down a path, much like Macbeth. Of course, he's doomed to, f- to do this in order to get ahead. But I don't see Macbeth and Joker being on the exact same wavelength. I mean, they're both maybe heroes of their own stories, both maybe not end the exact same way because Joker in Mary and Mary uh Mary in many versions, you know, sometimes dies, sometimes he doesn't. So just like when, you know, the news of there was a new Batman after the Schumacher movies, I was like, why are we having another Batman movie? So Batman begins. Wow, that took me by surprise. And then at the very end, we get the Joker card. I'm like, why are we doing the Joker? And then we get that brilliant performance by Heath Ledger. So when we look forward to, you know, like the Suicide Squad, which I was, again, one of my favorite movies, the Jared Leto character playing him didn't necessarily strike the the craziness and give a different interpretation of that character. But there was that much in in the way of substance. So with Joaquin Phoenix, this is all his movie. This is all about him, and I'm sure he's going to deliver the goods. And I cannot wait to see this later on. Uh, I think it's coming out in October. So holy crap, that is so damn good. And I really, from this point on, don't want to see any more information or trailers about the joker i really want to go in there knowing what i know now and just leave it at that i think it's good enough to just you got my money and definitely this is what you need to do then for a character like the joker you make it that way you make it that dark you make it super gritty suspenseful intriguing whereas Batman versus Superman. Again, I admit it, not the greatest, but I loved what it was, even though the tone was completely different for a lot of people's expectations. Whereas Joker, you expect this. You expect not a happy ending. So, all right. So on that note, I'm going to take my first break, and I'll come back and I'll talk about the new Twilight Zone episodes. We are the Metal Geeks Podcast, and on this show, we have Heavy Metal comic books, video games, movies, theme parks, and more. Wait, wait, wait. Comics? Yep. And movies? Exactly. Video games? Yeah. Metal? Of course. How does theme parks fit in this? It just does. All of us Metal Geeks can be found at MetalGeeks.net. At Metal Geeks for Twitter. Metal Geeks on Instagram. And Metal Geeks on the Facey Space. You can also find us on iTunes. Subscribe today. Metal Geeks! All right, so we are now back to talk about the Twilight Zone. Now, this is not going to be a history of what has come before, but I will put things in a certain context. Growing up back in the early 80s, I've watched the Twilight Zone on local TV, WPIX, Channel 11, very late at night, super creepy, Fantastic. It was right up there watching Star Trek soon after that. So it was a nice, interesting way of looking at different stories. Because it's basically, it's it's an anthology of stories. And they're not going to be pretty much tied together. And that's kind of cool. Outer Limits at that time also did similar kind of stories. Also telling anthologies. And not really connecting, although the new Twilight Zone, uh, which I thoroughly enjoy. It was a lot more sci-fi than I expected, but it really had uh, a much better vision of telling stories and the effects were better and it was fantastic. Whereas the updated for this one, the updated Twilight Zone movie, uh, Twilight Zone series, um, it was a kind of hit and miss. I remember the first... Um, first episode was with Bruce Willis. So this is before, you know, he was diehard and was still 
during the Seagram's commercials, and I believe, you know, he was still on Moonlighting. So it was called Shatter Day, and basically it was a person that his doppelganger was a better version of him, and that old version was being phased out, so to speak. Eh, it, it wasn't anything spectacular to, to, uh, to do. Now, there was the Twilight Zone movie, which, for the most part, I would say half of it was good. The opening and closing, fantastic. Opening was with uh, Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks. And I'm not going to go into the movie. Because if you have not seen it, I do want you to see it if you haven't. So, that's fantastic. It ties into the very end of it. Um, but then there were separate stories. Steven Spielberg, John Landis, uh, I believe it was Joe Dante. I'm thinking, I, I think it's George Miller. If I'm not mistaken, it was four directors. So of that, the last one, which it was the remake of the Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, which again was, I mentioned, William Shatner. This was done by, with uh, John, I think it was George Miller, but it was done with John Lithgow. A much better story, great performance, and that was probably the highlight as well as the ending that ties in from the very beginning. So, move to today, we have Jordan Peele, who, to, to get out, and us, so having that big success behind him, Twilight Zone is right up his alley. Right? I'm there. So we get the first of two episodes, and it's a 10-episode run that we're going to get through CBS All Access, again, behind the paywall. Now, the problem that I saw, not, and I'll get to the series in a moment, but much like Star Trek Discovery, because it's behind a paywall, I don't think that Twilight Zone, even though it's done by Jordan Peele, is going to have those people say, oh, I got to now watch this series and pay for this sight unseen. Whereas Star Trek Discovery relied on Star Trek fans to kind of be lured over to pay for content. Twilight Zone, like Star Trek, used to be free. Now you have to pay to watch these new Twilight Zone episodes. Now that <laughs> Discovery is almost over and the Twilight Zone will kind of take over a bit, um, slightly overlapping about a couple episodes, the question lies, is it going to be enough for people to say, I'm going to not only watch it, but I'm going to keep on paying for it after the first 10 episodes are done? and wait until next season, if there is. That's a whole separate discussion, and we'll see what happens. Now, I will say that the first two episodes I was eager to watch. The first one is called The Comedian. And um, Kuma Kumali... <laughs> and I practice, and I practice, and I really practice... And I like, I even like listen to this. I'm like, how do I pronounce his name? Camille Nanjani. Camille Nanjani. Okay. And I still have to play that in order for me to, to pronounce his name. All right. So I saw him in The Big Sick and he gave a great performance. I love his stand up routine. He's fantastic. Um, watching this first episode, first off, it's almost an hour long. Normal Twilight Zone episodes, half an hour. I don't remember this being that much longer. But whatever the case is, it's almost an hour. All right. So as a comedian, there was very adult humor or very adult language. That was thrown around. And I was kind of like, oh, my, I'm a gasp. And I'm kind of like, am I prudish? Am I really that prudish that I'm getting offended by the language that's being thrown around? 
And I get it that, you know, in the world, in that setting, sometimes that's how you communicate and that's fine. But this is the Twilight Zone and I'm just like, wow, that's, uh, that's kind of vulgar. And it's funny, but it's really vulgar. Okay, so when we get to the, the bulk of the episode, it has to do with him uh, giving himself to the audience and telling stories about things that affect him. Um, and then whatever that subject matter is, is pretty much then eliminated from reality. So he talked about his cat, uh, no, his dog, and then the dog goes missing, and then his nephew goes missing, and so forth and so forth. Until um, so he realized that, you know, he's become... He doesn't take great responsibility with his powers, basically. So he has, and it's kind of like almost like a death note kind of vibe after a while that he starts writing people's names. Like, I'm going to take that person out, that person out. He tries to take out Trump. Doesn't go <laughs> anywhere because it's not personal to him. So, but that's fine. You just leave it as that, okay? Um, and then things go worse because... Um, he thinks his girlfriend or uh, the woman that he's living with uh, is sneaking behind his back and takes out the mentor that she had and who would come over to the house. By And by doing so, she's no longer that person. So she is no longer a lawyer. She's now working uh, as a waitress. So she's no longer that same person, although they still have a relationship. So... Long story short, he decides then to take himself out to kind of, I guess, undo what has been done. And it's okay. The kind of kind of happy that Tracy Morgan got to be in the show. I didn't have that kind of feeling about the cycle kind of repeating again because the comedian that was lured with, you know, that secret sauce... Uh, that uh, the comedian was lured into, she didn't really need it because she was already funny. So that's something that I'm like, it didn't have that impact that I thought it should have. It didn't work. It didn't nail the landing. You have a really good setup. You had an interesting premise, but it, it kind of fell flat. Not like a wow, that's kind of cool. Um, it did have a moment, and I should have said this already, but uh, towards the end, um, kind of a reference to The Shining, uh, the one with Jack Nicholson. And if you've ever seen that, basically it's the character that was in the movie winds up dead, but somehow winds up being in a photograph that was from a party years ago, and somehow he's in that. All right. Again, eh. It didn't work. Much like Shatter Day, that Bruce Willis episode. Eh, it didn't work. All right, so we move on to <laughs> Nightmare at 30,000 Feet. This should have been a no-brainer. Because why? It's 10,000 feet more than the original Nightmare. So that's, like, really, really good. Well... <sighs> As cheesy as the first one was with Shatner. Black and white, there's a gremlin on that wing. Uh, okay, I get it. <laughs> but John Lithgow being super paranoid and the effects were better. And the gremlin is fantastically done. I wanted something like that. Or do something that will be like, it's freaky. It's Awesome. No. We get a similar character who is has seen some crap overseas and he's looking to, you know, <clears throat> find a better way of dealing with stress in life. But he finds when he's on boarding this plane an MP3 file or MP3 player, and it's a podcast of the very flight that he's on. And it starts detailing about what is going to happen. So that's what sets him down this path. And this is what drives the story. I'm like, all right, let's see how this goes. And um, it starts to get too close to home. 
with people breaking out their cell phones, about fights happening on airplanes, um, rude customer service, um, things that we know that we see every single day. And then at one point towards the, the climax of the story and the podcast is that um, goodbye, New York, or something to that effect is what's going to happen now with the last transmission before it goes to, to uh, before it goes uh, to suburban forever, right? So he's trying to warn a pilot uh, that this is what you're going to say. So as long as you don't say it, then we're okay. And But he has someone who is on his side. And winds up that he was a former pilot and he's been drinking. And he somehow gets the code to unlock the door to take over the cockpit. And then supposedly land the plane. Well, that reeked of what 9-11 felt like if you were on board, someone breaking in, taking control, and barricading oneself inside the cockpit. And I'm like, with that, plus like the, the fact that you have the missing Malaysian air flight that has never been discovered, I think that was just in poor taste. I felt really uncomfortable i felt really kind of upset about shouldn't someone have had said i think this is not a good idea um i remember bird box uh there were people that were upset because they showed an actual uh disaster scene in real life in the movie and netflix says we're not taking it out and later they did. So I'm not saying that this is exactly what's the same depiction, but because of certain elements showing up in a storyline, I think it's inappropriate. When 9-11 happened, uh, there was a movie, oh my God, it was with Tim Allen. It was supposed to be some kind of black comedy, but it was also dealing with something on a plane. And that movie kind of got pushed aside and scrapped because they didn't want to do that. Or if, if any, there's going to be some kind of uh, shooting on the news and there's a storyline that's coming up that's dealing with something like that, they're not going to do that. I just felt that this was in bad, really bad taste. So if that's how they're going to go with that story, the story didn't work at all for me because I was never invested once I knew where this was going. Okay. Now, to kind of go forward, and this is completely makes no sense. Everyone survives. Okay. According to the podcast, everyone survives except for one. Now, the, per the one person who doesn't survive is the very person who is listening to the podcast that is, that felt like he was the the central core of the whole thing happening in the first place, right? So as a plane, you see it's in pieces and there's things everywhere. And I'm like, okay, this is not good news. Because I was like, well, you could do a lost scenario and they're never found again. But for me to believe or put my, uh, my suspension on hold about certain elements being fantastical, this was not it. Because if everyone was unconscious, right, as the plane was going down, including the pilot, there's no way anyone would have survived. So my uh, uh, suspension of disbelief, I couldn't do that. Now, there was a little Easter egg in which in the water floating was a kind of like a doll, but it's the gremlin from the original Nightmare at, at, at 20,000 feet. I'm like, I don't care anymore. I really don't care at that point. You really took me out of that point for me to say, hey, I know, I get that reference, you know, like Captain America. No, I didn't like it. And... Uh, 
I tweeted it out to Jordan Peele and CBS All Access how I was kind of upset and apparently I guess I'm the minority in all this because I didn't I looked for people to give their reviews and everyone was just like okay well I had certain issues but nothing like what I just talked to you about so I'm kind of like wow <laughs> I'm really um looking at things at a different mindset and uh look i i know that my podcast is about you know sci-fi from a certain point of view but i just felt like i'm really out there by myself i don't think uh anyone has voiced any kind of concerns now i'm sure there are people that will have liked or not liked for whatever reasons on its own merits but nothing like what i've just said so all right, and this is a little bit longer than I want to go in, but, y you know, I'm going to still continue with The Twilight Zone. I'm, I'm eager to see what Jordan Peele can do, what he can bring to this franchise, but right now, it hasn't won me over. It, it's much like <laughs> watching the first two episodes of Star Trek Discovery, and then, like, season one, and then the story doesn't take place until the episode three when you're on discovery and then it continues <laughs> so we shall see how well the twilight zone continues so i'll give a review at the very end when it's the 10 episode run is done and look back at all the episodes but right now now nah, i i have more better things to watch which i did i got to see santa clarita diet season three Blew through that in a couple in a whole weekend. Fantastic. Much more enjoyable. I don't mind the dark humor and the gore and all that when I know that's that universe. I was kind of taken back about the language in the comedian and this this new updated storyline with Nightmare and Thirty Thousand Feet. I was not taken at all with it. So all right, so I'm gonna take another quick break and then talk about Ultraman. Hey gang, are you looking for another podcast to listen to? Well, you're in luck. The Nerdy Laser is a podcast, and we specialize in 90s nerd culture. But we don't leave anything out. If something is cool and nerdy, we will talk about it. So join myself, Richard Yule, and a variety of guests on the Nerdy Laser podcast. Available on iTunes, Podbean, and the ESO Network. All right. So we're now on to the last topic, which is going to be Netflix's new series or new anime series for Ultraman. Now, before I get into Ultraman, one of the things that I've appreciated is Netflix's versions or their push to have original content. Um, I was kind of disappointed with the Godzilla anime after the first movie. The uh, second and third are beyond belief. So I was greatly disappointed by how things were done. So they've done better stuff. Even She-Ra I've loved. Or the new Voltron I love. So... I'm excited to have another series to kind of jump on board with Ultraman. Now, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty about the origins of Ultraman because I don't know. Because, one, this is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Wait, sorry, wrong movie. Uh, <laughs> my introduction to uh, Ultraman. Uh, going back to, again, living in New York, there was, I think it, it was for Channel 9, W-O-R, or something like that. W it was a New Jersey channel that was Channel 9. And they were doing some kind of Chinese or Japanese um, TV show showcase. So they're introducing American audiences to their shows. 
And one of them talked about Ultraman, how it was their version of Superman. And, okay, sure, you got my intention back way back then. Um, but basically, it's, when you look at it, it's really campy. Because basically it's um, a man dressed in like a, an iron, kind of like an Iron Man suit that is able to become a giant and is able to fight against kaijus from week to week. Now, if you go to YouTube, you'll be able to see the endless amount of violence that Ultraman does in order to defeat his enemies. Whether you do that laser blast, you know, with that famous uh, crossing the the that putting the hand across the the bot uh, the, the the forearm and doing like a little weird uh, cross, uh, shoots out that laser, or he generates like the slicing disc thing, and the creatures are like cut in half, and it was just like, yeah, kids programming, sure. I don't know how they got away with it. I really don't. But uh, I came across a cool uh, YouTube video. Uh, it was called, it was basically it was like to watch this video before you watch the new Ultraman series. It was by Nerdwire. And I'll put a link in my show notes for that. And I had no idea that this show had continued, basically. In various forms and in, in uh, resurrections or incarnations for all these years. But the anime takes place basically, think of it as all the other stuff never existed. This is more like a direct sequel to the original series in which the original Ultraman is now much older. He still has no memory of Ultraman, although the American version, I, from what Nerdwire said, is that he still remembers that he was Ultraman, Ultraman, but that went a different way. So I'm not going to talk about which direction, other than he has a son, and basically he has lingering powers called the Ultraman of, uh, Factor. Um, and then he's basically recruited back to kind of continue the fight. So even though it, there's been peace for you know, the past 40 years, um, there was a, a new threat that was coming. So in this version, there is a, a, a new big bad, Bam Mular. And right at the second episode, we do get to see what the anime can do with 3D technology and just kind of, wow, this is fantastic stuff. So after the second episode that I watched this, I was kind of hooked on it. And because I work at a library and I know I have Ultraman mangas, I was like, I wonder if the ones that I have are a continuation of the story or this Ultraman manga is completely different. But literally it is... The exact same stuff that you read in the manga is the exact same shots that were created for this. Even the script is the same. So I'm like, okay, I don't want to read ahead with the manga because basically you're going to like know the story ahead of time. So for the most part, it's fine because the, the son takes over the role of Ultraman and at one point, I'm thinking, oh, it feels like if I was watching Young Iron Man, that I think Nickelodeon, was it Nickelodeon that was doing that TV series that I was just like, you're really going to do this? Young Tony Stark in a Young Iron Man suit. And I'm like, no, it sucks. But in this version, because his father is kind of out of, out of commission, he has taken over the role of Ultraman. Now, again, I don't have any memories that I can tell you from uh, the storylines, like he fought this creature, that creature, except for that he became giant. 
and they fought over a city. In this version so far, he is just a regular normal size human in this kind of mecha outfit. And he's flying Bumilar, Bemular um, and a couple other things. Uh, there are a um, couple of things that kind of threw me off. There was this one creature, and I don't remember because I, I just don't remember. But he is, I guess, from the previous Ultraman. Um, I'm trying to get his name. His name is Edo, right? If Edo, his race, who had tried to uh, destroy Earth, became now an ally, it is this weird vegetable head looking freaky thing with one eye um you don't see his mouth move but he does talk and it's like if eeyore had talked like an alien his voice keeps dropping high and low in modulation and i'm like why is he talking like that but i'm like all right if we're gonna do alien ish voices that's i guess as close as you're going to get to that kind of thing. Now, about, again, four and a half episodes in, close to the fifth, am I enjoying myself? I am for the most part. I'm kind of okay with this. Um, it's not the exact same version of what was done before, other than they make references to the original content, but this is completely different um, in, in that respect. So, um, I'll see how it turns out, but I'm definitely watching it, not necessarily binging it, but I did watch at least a couple of episodes to get a, get a good feel for this. Um, so it's been a lot of good positive feedbacks that I saw online about the series. So I'm kind of cool. I don't have to rush through, unlike, as I mentioned, the Santa Clarita diet, which I just couldn't help myself. Here, I'm good, but... In my head, I was still thinking about the giant, you know, Ultraman fighting the Kaijus and along that lines. So it doesn't have that. Maybe it will. I don't know. But in any case, it, it's still entertaining enough for me to be thrilled with it. And we'll see what happens in the next couple of episodes. But uh, aside from that, this is now coming to the end, finally, of the podcast. So, uh... We'll see how it goes for the next part here because um, I'm hoping to see Shazam again before Mr. Jane and I talk. Hopefully that will be the next podcast. If not, there'll be another round of sci-fi news. And the other thing, too, is that when I started the first part of this recording and uh, talked about the wind chimes, well, I had to go take a break and go see my mom with the kids and go have dinner and then come back. She got me another set of wind chimes <laughs> that I have in my backyard. And this one is actually for me. I got Superman wind chimes. And uh, it's kind of cool. And if you go to my Instagram page, Monster Sci-Fi Show, you'll see the picture of what I'm talking about. My new cool Superman wind chimes. But uh, that's it. I hope you enjoyed my podcast for now. Uh, sorry it's a little bit longer than expected, but I had a couple of issues damn it twilight zone <laughs> we'll go from there all right so don't forget you can always email me at monster sci-fi show at gmail.com remember you can follow me in the various social networks i just mentioned you know instagram i have a lot of cool pictures i do post from time to time and not just off the podcast but other cool things so thank you for listening to me and to the monster sci-fi show podcast it's sci-fi from a certain point of view. Good night. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.